Thank you, thank you. All right, that was really nice. All right, so um, um, my name is Paul, and um, as you might have gotten from this theme, you know, we're trying to limit our, our carbon footprint. So I thought um, I would talk to you guys about nature and the genius of nature and kind of how to design a closed loop system. All right, so um, I want you to kind of think about first, thinking about a, a new type of technology, right? Do we have a carbon problem? Too much of it is in the atmosphere, warming the planet. Let's think of some new technology that can come in you know, scrape out all that carbon and sequester it, you know, capture it. So, you know, this technology would be great if it's, you know, solar powered. You don't want it fossil fuel power that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Self-repairing, in case it breaks down, it can fix itself. You know, it's scalable, adaptable. It can replicate itself. It may have a technology in mind. What if it's versatile, inexpensive, could provide habitat, edible? <laughs> you can even build your house out of it? What am I talking about? Yeah, that's right, trees, right? So it could be things like this, you know? So sequoias, like these giant sequoias or bristlecone pines. See, nature does not believe in waste. Waste is a human concept. These trees right here, these guys waste an extremely toxic, corrosive gas called um, uh, oxygen, right? It just so happens that we use oxygen and we spit out a really nasty gas called carbon dioxide which so happens these guys use. In fact, these guys use this stuff and they make tomatoes, right? Their waste is really resources. So we need to be thinking about things in terms of waste equaling resources, all right? So that's the plan for a closed loop type of system. All right, so we have a lot of these biological systems that are all around us right now. So, you know, up in this corner here, we have my little friends, the black soldier fly larva. You know, we have fish, animals, things like bees, all these biological systems help support our way of life. You can really think about humans and our way of life like a hammock. All these biological systems supporting that hammock. The more that we go in there and we cut those strings and break down those systems, the more we fall. Some of those strings are very thick and greatly support us. I don't know, like you know, these guys here, you know, br you know, bring in about a third of our food. Let's not cut that string. Right? So if we can change how we think about waste and move them into you know, reinforcing some of these biological systems, we can optimize those biological systems for our own needs, especially things like here, like bacteria. You know, bacteria are the main drivers of some of these ecological systems. So you can take those systems and you can modify them just a little bit, you know, write your name in them. You know, maybe you can make them into a little smiley face. You can optimize these systems for our own wants, desires, and, and needs. Right. Okay, so our story begins with mining. All right, now when I say mining, you might think about things like coal mining, you might think about fracking, blood diamonds, right? Whatever you got, La Brea, you know, like tar pits, tar sands, whatever. I'm not talking about this type of mining, I'm talking about these guys. And they're not behind the corn, it is the corn. All right, what a plant is, what corn is, soy, wheat, any of those guys, they are plants that mine the soil for little bits of stuff to build more plants. Right, so these guys gather up these nutrients, mostly phosphates and nitrates, and then we take corn and we ship it all over the world. And it looks like this. You guys might have had some popcorn recently, some you know, corn on the cob. And if you haven't had corn like this, I bet you you had some corn like this. All right? Or maybe you had some corn that was fed to an animal. Or maybe you had an animal that was fed corn battered in corn, and then fried in corn oil, right? So basically, you know, we are, we are basically made of corn, right? We're walking corn cobs, all right? Now, you don't use that corn. It doesn't go away, all right? You rent that corn, all right? And it goes somewhere else, all right? And where it goes is here. This is a wastewater treatment plant just across the bay over here in, in Brandon. 12 million gallons of rolling sewage. I love this sign. It's kind of funny, right? <laughs> I would assume it's not potable, right? So anyway, when you flush and it goes here, those nutrients are not recaptured and turned back into corn. Where do they go? They go out into our bay. So all those plant building blocks, what you know, poop really is, ends up in our water systems. Not terribly toxic to humans, unless you pull out, you know, you pull out all the you know, nasty E. coli and stuff like that. But the plant building blocks, those things, those nitrates and phosphates that end up in our bay, those things destroy the ecosystems of our bay. 
you know, and if you just, you know, don't know, you're in St. Pete, you know, we're not exactly the best as far as uh, our waste management strategies. These are all of those, you know, either wastewater systems, you know, hazardous material dumps, all those things around our system. A lot of these areas are leaching those plant building materials into our bay and greater, um, you know, water systems. So what happens when you mix a whole lot of these plant building materials into the water? What are you going to get? Plants. You know, you're going to get things that grow at the top of the water system, where sunlight meets plant building material. And when you have algae growing at the top of those systems, you kill all those fish. You suck out all those, that oxygen. Because what happens is when all those little plants die, they suck oxygen out of the water, and fish can't survive. And you're like, I don't care. I don't like fish. I don't go to the beach. Humans are affected as well. This is red tide, you know, fueled by all those plant building nutrients in our water system. Okay, let's go back to the farm, right? Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, you know, our farm belt. What's missing there, right? Those phosphates and nitrates, plant building materials. Where are they? They're in our bay. We call them pollution in our bay. At the farm, they're called resources. Let's link the two back together. All right, so what does the farmer have to do now? He's got to call up this company, right? Now, this company mines the ground for phosphates and nitrates and ships them back to the farm as resources. And Mosaic, I love this, their slogan, right? Helping the world grow the food it needs. We grow enough food. Food access is the problem. Food waste is the problem. All right, so if, if you don't know, Mosaic builds these giant, you know, big mountains, Florida mountains, I guess. Um, and they have all sorts of ecological problems. If we look through their list just in the past few years, you know, destroying the Alifaya River, you know, having to pay billions in uh, fines for hazardous waste, not exactly um, the best, let's put it that way. All right, so that's just the problem of the food that we eat. What about the food that we don't eat? What about the, uh, I think uh, Tara put it best, the biting of the thing with the delicious and then the throwing into the, <laughs> right, into the trash? You know, a third of the food that we create goes straight to the landfill, right, straight to the dump. So we grow a huge amount of food. We spend a huge amount of resources to grow a huge amount of food, and then we waste a third. All right, so put that in tons. It's about 1.3 billion tons. It's hard for our you know, little primate brains to wrap our uh, minds around. But what we have created is a pipeline that runs from farm to landfill. We are moving nutrients from the farm straight to landfill. All right? We have created this pipeline. This isn't food that's uh, necessarily spoiled. This is food that might look a little funny. It's a little bit too big, a little bit too small. Maybe the carrot is forked and we won't buy it. Maybe it's the last bit of arugula, right? We bought the other one, All right? This is good food that's going to waste as well. This isn't just rotting food. So what's the cost in cash, right? We're talking billions of dollars. Worldwide, it's nearly a trillion dollars, right? Just in the US alone, you're looking at around 150 or so billion dollars in, in just in food waste. I'd like to have 150 bill, right? We don't mean that bad. We're flushing that down the toilet. All right, so a trillion dollars a year. If you look at that at humanitarian costs, just in food waste, all the industrialized countries waste nearly as much as all of the sub-Saharan countries combined. Right? That's the stuff that we're throwing into landfill. We're growing that food, we're spending carbon resources, we're spending water, we're spending land, all those things to grow food that we're sending to landfill for no reason other than it looks a little funny. All right, what about greenhouse gas emissions? If you made food waste a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world. It would go China, US, and food waste as the third largest emitter. It's a massive problem. What about land cost? All right, if you look at all the land that we spend to grow all this food, we waste a third of that land, growing a third of the food that we throw to landfill. That equates to about 82 Floridas in the world that are purely grown to throw food into the trash. All right, what about the water cost? I mean, we're concerned about drips in our faucets. You can leave this faucet on for three years, every year. That's the water that we spend on food waste, right? This is a huge problem, huge problem. Biodiversity costs from mowing down rainforests, right? What about the animal cruelty costs from industrialized food lots? You know, keeping animals in small, confined containers for their entire life. What's that? I just put poop emoji, right? It's a very hard scientific concept to get around. It's not, it's hard to quantify, right? But it means something, 
Right? We're spending all this time, energy, money, carbon, to grow stuff we're shipping to landfill at tremendous humanitarian cost, environmental cost, and also you know, animal welfare cost, all these things. All right, so how do you heal this system? All right, how do you link resources back to waste and waste back to resources? All right, this is what we do. All right, so we set up a compost system that basically captures that food waste, turns it back into food, keeping those resources local and trying to link this broken food system. So how it kind of works is there will be some food waste. There will be some. There are always peels and cores and pits and scrapings and whatever. There will be some. We must try to limit that at first. But whatever that's there, we can capture that. And don't ship it to landfill. Capture those resources and keep them local. So instead of shipping them to landfill or putting them in your garbage disposal, which eventually ends up in your septic or in wastewater, which eventually ends up in the bay somehow, we can keep those and turn them back into soil. You compost those things, they actually act like a soil sequestering machine or a carbon sequestering machine. They turn those things back into soil, they snatch carbon out of the atmosphere. You can actually recycle nutrients. You know, I hate to break this to you guys, but things don't go away, right? When you throw things away, there isn't in a way, right? The very same water that you guys are drinking in your coffee is, you know, dinosaur pee, right, from a long time ago. Right? Things don't go away. All the stuff that we got right here, right now, that's it. We're just reformatting this stuff, changing its function, changing its form. But the same basic building blocks, they're still here. They're the same bits. Let's not throw them in a landfill. Something designed to hold onto those things you know, forever. So we can actually recycle these things, turn them back into soil, which eventually turns back into food. That's the way nature intended it. Right? A sustainable, resilient system. We can look back to that system, use that system, optimize that system to keep this system going on. All right, so how do we get rid of this waste in a hurry? Right? So as we're gathering up all this food waste in our community, look back to nature right? and become a maggot farmer. All right, now I'm rebranding maggots. All right? So that's my mission. All right, so maggots are an incredibly important. I mean, all those detritivores, all the things that break down dead stuff, are incredibly important in our ecosystem. They take dead stuff, that dead raccoon in the forest. They break that sucker down and turn it back into stuff that makes more raccoons, right? That's the point of a detritivore, something that eats dead things. And maggots are incredibly good, incredibly efficient at breaking things down. So this is what I got. Now I put some show maggots out there for you guys to look at. I put some, uh, some sawdust on them, clean them up a little bit, but that's basically what they look like coming out of the system. All right, so what these guys do is they're really, really good at breaking down food waste. All types, so meats, you know, no problem, especially the meats. And what I've used is this guy here, it's a black soldier fly. It's native to Florida, and it's key, you know, I'd say like, you know, cool factor, cool card, no mouth when it's an adult. So this guy right here, this adult, this thing that looks kind of like a wasp, even though it doesn't sting, has no stinger, um, it doesn't have a mouth, which means when it's a little baby, like I have over there, it eats a huge amount of food. It's got to store up a huge amount of calories, in order to keep all, uh, have enough energy to fly around, lay eggs, and then as soon as it does that, it dies. All right, so it's kind of like little batteries when they're babies. All right, so those little maggot babies, they're excellent at eating food. That's their job when they're young. And then they turn into that fly, fly around, lay eggs, and then die. That's their cycle. So they start off as these little tiny eggs, spend a little bit of time as this guy right here, this guy has a mouth, and they're voracious. Imagine if you knew, as soon as you went through puberty, you could never eat again. You'd eat more than when you were you know, prepubescent, right? So then they turn in these little black critters here. At this point, they no longer have a mouth. They digest their you know, mouth area, I guess, or whatever. They turn into like a little climber tool, and they use that to climb to the highest point in their environment, because the highest point is generally the driest point. And once it's that dry, it allows them to create a cocoon to turn into this guy here, the fly. So look to nature, design a compost bin that's angled on the sides like this, so that as the you know, little maggot babies, maggot babies, right? Or fly babies, whatever we're going, okay. So as those little fly babies grow up, they wanna climb out. As soon as they reach that calorie potential, they climb up this ramp, some angled sides here, they fall into these tubes. They're walking the plank, right? You capture those little bits of energy, those little batteries, and then you feed them to other critters, right? So if you um, look inside my bin, you've got some, uh, some toilet paper tubes here which allows the adults to come back and lay eggs and keeps this cycle going, okay? Now, if this is what the bin looks like, it's kind of settled next to our house, and if you open up that bin, it's like maggot Armageddon on the inside, okay? So a whole bunch of maggots. So this is what's so cool, you can just chuck whatever you want in there, hot dogs or whatever, hamburgers, you chuck them in there, and those guys go to town, 
All right, they, they ripped that food waste apart. So to kind of give you that example, I made a little time lapse video. We're going to put 5,000 black soldier fly larvae, all right, maggot babies, fly babies, against a Big Mac value meal. What do you think? <laughs> Kudos to my friend Steve Woodoff for allowing me to bring uh, 5,000 soldier fly larvae into his uh, studio. <laughs> so this is um, about an hour into it. And then they go for the fries, right? Who waits, who waits for the last for the fries? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> so something about five hours or so to take down about a pound of food waste. So if you can really amplify these, these guys, you can really take down a huge amount of food waste and then capture that energy, capture those nutrients that are inside that food, and then turn it right around and send it right back into that ecosystem. All right, so you've got all these little tiny batteries, these little tiny maggot babies, right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to feed them to fish. And the same problem that we were just talking about with the bay, poop in the water, little tiny plant bits that need to make new plants that are instead making algae, let's turn that around and make them grow food, right? food plants. So you feed those guys to fish, particularly tilapia. Those guys poop, as we all do, I've heard. All right, so <laughs> that poop comes out, and you, guess you send fishy, poopy water right, to these gravel beds. This gravel bed has plant building nutrients in it and water. Well, guess what? Plants love that, right? Water plus plant building stuff. And you get to grow a whole bunch of plants. Plants scrape out all those phosphates and nitrates and they send clean water back to the fish. If you've ever had a fish tank and you've battled algae problems, right, you know this cycle already, right? If you've been in there scraping out algae, what you're not doing is removing that, uh, the plant building nutrients. So in this case, what we're doing is feeding tilapia little tiny batteries, and growing food from that. So this is what we set up on our little farm. Set up a whole bunch of fish tanks. We take that black soldier fly larva. We send it over to those fish. They eat it. That poopy water gets sent into gravel beds, and we grow a whole bunch of plants in there. So this is what we got. We got food waste entering the food bin or the maggot bin. You got to feed those guys to some uh, tilapia. Now let's say any little bits of that tilapia, you know, if you've ever cleaned a fish, a large amount of that is not edible, Send it right back to the soldier fly bin. Guess what they do with it? Turn it right back into fish food. All right, so you take all that fish food, you know, that, the, uh, send it, or all that fish waste, and you send it over to some gravel, and you grow yourself a heck of a ton of plants. And then all those little plant scrapings or you know, tomato bits or cores or peels or whatever goes right back to the maggot bin, and you also produce a whole bunch of food from it. All right, so trying to actually look at waste like it's a resource. Quit sending it to the landfill or the incinerator. All right, so does it work? That's the question, All right? So this is May 19th, set up some gravel beds, turned on the fish tank, one month later, a whole bunch of plants. You know, not only can you grow a huge amount of food in a system like this, but you do it on a tenth of the water. Because normal agricultural systems, you take a whole bunch of fertilizer, you put it on the ground, you plant a seed, now you put a whole bunch of water on top of that, and you pray that some of that water absorbs some of that fertilizer and hits some of those roots, and it doesn't always. Most of that stuff, goes downstream into our rivers, lakes, streams, eventually into our bays and oceans, and then pollutes those things with those plants and plant nutrients. Right? So we have to over-fertilize. In a case like this, we can do it on a tenth of the water because there's no evaporation. So if you're standing at one of these things, you never actually see the water. The water's just coming up underneath the gravel and then going back down. So we can grow a huge amount of food in systems like this powered by people's food waste. So we've built basically a food machine underneath our house where food waste comes in, and food comes out, all right? There's nothing new, there's nothing inventive, there's no genius, right? If anything, it's plagiarism, all right? You went to nature, and you're like, what is nature? Oh, okay, I'll do that, all right? And that's exactly what we've done. So we can grow a whole bunch of, anything you can grow in the ground, you can pretty much grow like, like this. So we've hung some wires, you can grow things like pumpkins and watermelons and all sorts of stuff um, using a system like this. But there's other systems that we can grow from this system as well. So for instance, like food waste comes in the maggot bin. You recognize this. Creates a whole bunch of batteries. And now we can feed chickens. Chickens love these things. All right? Chickens produce eggs. Eggshells go back into the maggot bin. Produce eggs, all sorts of different colors. And then you can actually sell those things. You can actually get waste, stuff people are happy to take away or pay you to take away, and turn it right back into stuff you can sell. All right? And if you guys don't know anything about chickens, they're awesome. I don't know. Like, I really. Wasn't sure about chickens at first, but um, uh, as soon as I got into it, I was like, yeah, these things are awesome. I thought they'd be like carrots in the backyard. I'd be like, yeah, I got carrots back there. But 
Chickens are awesome. They all have their personalities. Uh, you know, we had like a little chicken party. I had, and actually for my birthday, I got some chicks and I got some materials to make tiny hats and we had a tiny hat party. <laughs> so, you know, you can have some fun like this. All right, and I recommend if you're gonna go for chickens, get a whole bunch of different types, lay a whole bunch of different colored eggs and you have like a little bouquet of, uh, of chickens. And other systems are spiraling off of this system. Like, you know, we're, we're doing a lot with bees, making beeswax and making lip balm. Um, and we've done other things like, you know, our lawn. You know, lawns are stupid, there's no doubt. Right? You're, you're spending fossil fuels to mow those suckers. You're spending fossil fuels to create the nitrates and phosphates that you want to put down here so everybody has a nice, green, pristine monoculture. Where in nature do they like to have a monoculture, a single organism that just dominates everything? Good luck finding that. Right? But that's what we want to hold on to. And there's a lot of energy we have to invest in order for that to happen. So you take your lawn and you rip that sucker up. <laughs> right? You plant a bunch of stuff and you grow yourself some food. All right? The exact same processes you can use for growing lawns, you can just grow food. All right? There's no reason to spend it on a monoculture. All right, so what are we really taking away here? For me, personally, this little adventure has really led to a greater sense of connection. All right, for each me and my friends and family, I have students who, who call me up and they say, like, hey, I just gathered up like 50 pounds from my cafeteria. You want it? <laughs> sure. Right? Friends and family, you're more in tune with the seasons, right? You understand how egg production goes up and down. The seasons, you, I mean, we yearn for those fresh greens, you know, come around November and December, right? We want to plant and cook seasonally, right? That connection that we're all maybe yearning for is here, right? We've been an agricultural type of society for, you know, a long time, until relatively recently. Now you can buy eggs, same price, all year round. You can buy strawberries all year. That should not be a thing, but it is, all right? So especially with my nieces, you know, my nieces come over and they pick lettuce, right? My nieces come over, they pick kale and lettuce and they eat it like a lollipop. What kids do that, right? If you want your kids to eat veggies, have them grow veggies, right? Have them connected with that. You know, like uh, my, my kid loves broccoli, <laughs> right? Like loves broccoli. I mean, you put that near her, right? And she'll hunt it down. So, and then of course, like catching chickens. That's always the thing, I don't, you know, yeah. All right, so what are some things we can take away, some actionable items that we can do to really waste less? Number one, um, our shopping habits. When you go to Publix or, or wherever, um, I want you to shop happy, not hungry. Because if you shop hungry, you walk down the grocery store with your, your cart and you just go like this, right? <laughs> and you just scoop all those things into your cart because you're starving, right? And when you get home, you're like, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> Guess where all that's gonna go? Right? That's one of our major contributors of food waste. It's just basically overbuying. Buying in bulk because it might be cheaper, but you end up wasting more of that. Love your leftovers. Right? Take those leftovers home. Don't leave them on the table. Right? Take those leftovers home and actually eat them. Okay? And I like this one, buy ugly. Right? There's the ugly food movement. Those are the two-fourths carrots or those uh, th oranges that are a little bit small or a little bit big. Right? Ugly food. It tastes the same. Right? It looks a little different. Buy some ugly food. You can also use a smaller refrigerator. So the same sort of aesthetics that we like, sort of this like clean, open spaces, like, you know, like this space. You know, we hate that in our refrigerator. When we see clean, open spaces in our refrigerator, we think, I'm gonna starve. <laughs> we like to see abundance in our refrigerator. And if you buy a huge refrigerator, guess what you're gonna do every week? You're gonna fill that sucker up because you don't wanna see anything but abundance. Small refrigerator, smaller food waste. You can also buy recycled materials. I, I, I mean, we're all pro-recycling, right? Are we pro buying recycled materials? We should be looking for and voting with our dollars for those things. We're only completing one half of the loop when we decide to recycle. We need to be buying recycled, maybe paying extra for recycling, enforcing that cycle to make sure we keep those materials out of landfill. We can also buy uh, and visit local farms. Right? When you buy local food from local people, you keep those people in business. Right? So make sure we keep those nutrients in, um, in our systems as well as you know, reinforcing those cycles with each other. You're gonna get those connections and you're gonna do, uh, do a lot better. Plus there's all sorts of studies with you know, like food miles and deterioration of food from you know, like shipping things when they're not ripe, thousands of miles. That's another, another talk maybe. All right, so move to a plant-based diet. I mean, if you're gonna drive a Prius or electric car, you should be eating more plants. Cows and meat are incredibly energy intense. Think about what you have to do if you're in South America you're gonna bulldoze a rainforest to grow food 
for the food that you're going to feed to people, right? So you have to grow about 10 pounds of food to feed about one pound of cow meat. That's a huge amount of soy, wheat, or whatever. If you're a starving family, you want 10 pounds of grain, or do you want one pound of cow meat? Right? Why feed it to a cow? So moving to a plant-based diet is much more efficient. It's much more environmentally conscious. It's one of the bigger things you can do to help this carbon problem. Also, understanding what expiration dates are. I hate to tell you, but food manufacturers figured this out, right? They said, if you put an expiration date that says, hey, best buy next Thursday, what are you going to do on Friday? You're going to buy another one of those things. So it's in their best interest to make sure that those expiration dates are as close to your purchase date as possible. So understand those dates. Understand what an expiration date is and buy by date, buy by date, or use by date, sorry. And other things like all those little like buy certain dates. There's no regulation for those things, except for baby formula, I think. And that's it. So make sure that you guys understand those things. Make sure it passes the smell test. That's a good way to do it. Um, also, be informed about the life cycle of the products that we use. We are in a disposable economy. Try to buy things that are more resilient, that you can use for a longer time, that keeps those materials out of landfill. All the things that we buy, you know, the, the clothes that we have, those things are pretty much disposable. Let's try not to make them disposable. Right? Keep reusing those things. Buy for longevity. And then finally, um, you know, dig up your lawn and grow something. I mean, that's one of the bigger things you can do. Even if it's a small plot and you're just growing like mint or herbs or whatever, that's something, and it'll kind of get you hooked. And it'll keep those resources in the environment, all right? Our environment. All right, so um, if you want to uh, keep in touch or, you know, follow us on the farm, uh, this is like our chicken coop, and I always do like tours and stuff, and we have Facebook and Instagram, and I don't know, my, my wife runs that. So <laughs> I'm too busy in the back. Um, but you know, keep in touch with us. And we always do like farm tours. So if you want to come see like some kind of crazy maggot cycle and the maggot farmer, uh, we can kind of take you through an a in-person, in-touch uh, tour. So don't be afraid to hit us on any of these things. And uh, thank you very much for your time. OK, uh, yeah, we're going to open up to question and answer. Who has questions? You guys must have questions after that. <laughs> Is there anything maggots can't eat? <laughs> yeah, uh, they, yeah they, they actually really like the things that, like, you know, your typical composter. You might have heard, like, your browns and greens and stuff, and, like, no meats or oils. Um, that's, that's mainly because uh, uh, people aren't using this, this system. The maggots really don't like the really high cellulose stuff. So like, uh, think about um, like nothing but brown leaves, like oak leaves. They're not so happy about that. You know, red worms and other sorts of com like, you know, composters, uh, you know, organisms will eat those things. The maggots typically like all the stuff that other composters can't handle. So your oils and your even things like cheeses and meats. They just, you know, they, as you saw, like, you know, the Big Mac is very much oil, cheese, and meat. And so uh, they just shred those things. So that's some of their favorite, favorite foods. So they really don't like the plant-based stuff. They like the, the animal-based stuff if they have a choice. But if it's really sugary, they love, they love sugar as, as everybody does. So, uh, so they're, they're up for that. Yeah, want me to? Yeah, just so it gets captured. So I'm a student, and so students like are typically super duper busy. So what can we do in like the limited amount of time that we have to kind of like contribute to reducing like our carbon footprint? Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think it's just students that are busy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's always always a question. Um, whenever I hear that like you're, I'm too busy, I always ask, did you did you catch uh, what's your favorite TV series? Game of, Game of Thrones, right? And you're all caught up, right? Okay, all right. But mostly, yeah. Okay, but mostly, yeah. So, I mean, you can have enough time to, to, you know, build, you know, 20 or 30 hours of TV watching, right? So you can always take that time and put it somewhere else if, if you wanted to, if you made it a priority. So that's one answer. And if you don't have that time, if you're like, nah, it's not as important as Game of Thrones, all right, <laughs> then you can try to do other things too. Like, I, I always think like voting with your dollars. I know that we get a lot of publicity for, for voting every two years or four years or whatever. You vote every day, every day with your dollars. So if you go to a local place versus a non-local place or you visit the farm or you don't, you know, that's voting with your dollars is voting with your feet. I think that's the biggest thing we can do. So recognize your values that, that you have and then try to find those values in, in different uh, companies and corporations. You know, uh, corporations and, and companies, there are machines that are built to take your dollars. That's it. 
right? So if you decide that my dollars only go to things that share my, my values, then you can reinforce those, those companies. And you know, companies and, and other organizations can make a, a bigger difference because uh, they're more of a, a collective. But don't, don't be uh, uh, disillusioned by our own individual efforts. You know, we got ourselves in this mess with individual efforts. We can get ourselves out of this mess with individual efforts. It's very difficult, but we can definitely, definitely do it. And it starts by, you know, like showing up. So, you know, nice. Yeah. So does this scale? I mean, you mentioned voting with your dollars. Are there large organizations that we can buy from that are practicing what you're preaching? Yes, it can scale. Um, so there are other um, cities that have, you know, curbside collection for food waste. You know, Seattle. yeah, Seattle, New York. There's a bunch. Yeah, San Fran's been doing it for a long time. Mostly, it's a West Coast type of thing. It's it's big now in the Northeast. You know, in Florida, we're just the cutting edge for environmental. <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised we're not because we're the most at risk. We got the most head in the sand. So. Um, uh, yes, it does. As far as the, the collection side, yeah. Um, as far as linking all these things, probably. Um, no one's really done like large-scale versions, but there's large-scale versions of each of these systems. There are uh, Chinese companies who are building breeding programs for black soldier flies and shipping just the eggs. So, uh, especially for uh, large-scale uh, animal production. So think about the sheer scale of something like a chicken farm. A chicken farm that might have uh, 100,000 birds or more, some more, and pigs. So you're talking like a, a chicken farm that has 100,000 birds will have something like 700, 600,000 pounds um, you know, of, of poop, right? 200,000 pounds of poop. What are you going to do with all that, right? So if you drop in a bunch of those eggs, those soldier flies will tear down all that poop and they'll get rid of it. Right, you can refeed those things to other feedstocks. And what's really cool about these flies is that they're actually their digestive system will destroy the salmonella and E. coli, some of the, the major disease vectors. Um, so that's a that's a good thing. So like each one of these things is is scalable. I'm not sure if anyone's ever tried scaling up each of these things. Um, there are large scale aquaponics farms. Um, they're they do that, and it's like especially important in places like South. Western U.S. where there's water issues, uh, you know, growing things like almonds in California is probably not the best idea, right? Because they're incredibly water intensive. So if we can, uh, and these things are also, um, think about like places like Detroit, uh, cities that are downsizing. You know, some of those industrial areas, the, the ground itself might be permanently unable to farm. You know, you have industrial areas that have been dumping a lot of lead, mercury, uh, into the ground, lead and mercury, those are, those are pollutants that don't go away. They don't biodegrade. That is biodegraded. So you don't want to farm in areas like that. So having an aquaponic system that doesn't use soil could be a good uh, alternative to land that might be compromised. So in some of those places where you're trying to like, figure out what to do with people, um, how to grow local food for uh, you know, food deserts, some of these places can, or some of these systems can really be used. I want me to walk? I got it. Um, say people that don't have space for like an aquaponics farm, have you figured out a way to use these flies to actually make soil? Uh, yeah. So, um, so like the, the, the maggots do poop, right? And they, that poop is actually really, really nutrient dense as well. And they do all the same fun things that like redworms do with like worm tea. So they create their own tea. Um, anytime that they're breaking things down, they're breaking or you know they're turning it into the building blocks to make new things. So you can send that stuff right back into uh, you know into the soil and it breaks down even faster. So um, for people in small scale, there are small scale aquaponics builds you can use uh, for cheap. Um, it's basically you built yourself an aquarium, um, and then you can grow things like your herbs and mints if it's like really small. And then if you're trying to build something enough to like you've got a small backyard area, you can use one of those. Uh, uh, they're called IBC toads. You can buy them on Craigslist for like 120 bucks. You can cut that sucker in half. Uh, you basically flip it upside down. You have a fish tank on the bottom. You have a grow bed on the top. Run a pump. So you're talking about like a $200 build in a weekend, and you got yourself uh, a little food factory in your backyard. You know. So there are small scale versions. Just a, a YouTube video away, if you want to. Yeah. So my fall goal is to kind of have my own like 
I'm going to grow my own vegetables. However, I've done the whole Google thing and trying to figure out what I can grow and how I can grow it. Is there, like, local places around here where I can talk to someone? Because it's kind of overwhelming yeah. when you look at it, and it's either I'm about to have a huge farm in my backyard or I'm about to just have a bunch of dead plants. So... <laughs> <You're gonna have laughs> Um, so th there's some good resources, like community resources, like uh, we have a, a partnership between Hillsborough County and UF, so the Extension Office. Um, they offer, if you're um, in Pinellas County and in Hillsborough County, uh, they can offer you composting classes. They have resources on when to plant and what to plant, things like that. Um, it's uh, the UF Extension Office. And you can, uh, all this stuff is free, pay for you with your tax dollars, so. Um, that, but I would recommend using it as a guide. Everybody is different where in the soil, con I mean like Florida is a giant sandbox, right? So we don't exactly have the best quality soil. Um, so your first year of farming might just be like just building soil. You know, get some mulch delivered from a, uh, an arborist for free, you know, use that to, as like a water capture. Because if you drop water on the sand, it just goes right through. Um, if you put some mulch down, mulch can act like a kind of like a, a sponge and suck onto that water and then you can hold on to water better. You have to irrigate less. So when the, you know, the storms come through every day at five, then it'll hold on to water to the next day at five. So you can you know, save water, things like that, by adding a lot of carbon to, to your soil, because our soil is below subpar, right? So, um, so you can contact them. There's also local gardening groups, you know, of course on Facebook and, and wherever. Um, and I, I really recommend just trying stuff. Just go out there and try stuff. Just see what happens. Because they might tell you, oh, this is the time and the place and the variety, and it doesn't work because you have a local pest that might be, you know, for some reason not, you know, allowing you to do that thing. And sometimes the things that you're not supposed to be able to do, you can do. It just sort of depends. So I, I like this sort of a shotgun approach. Buy what you think you might eat, first of all. Try that. And the 50% of dead plants you might have, then keep the 50 that work, and then try a whole other 50, and then just keep working. Eventually you're, what you're going to end up with is kind of a repertoire of, like, all the stuff that works well for your area, your little microclimate. Um, but yeah, our season's coming up, so yeah. pretty much anything people can plant elsewhere in the country in the summertime, we can plant here uh, with a few exceptions. And you can always contact us if you want to get some advice and stuff too, so yeah, okay. I can go forever, so. Um, so, save the date. That girl's talking, there she is. Ooh, hi, yay! Um, September 15th, Kate Berlin, she runs Purple Dot Yoga Project. It's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be at Nova, we're gonna be hula hooping, you should be there. Okay, that's it, thank you all so much for coming.